everyone for joining uh, uh, today's session on innovation to energy to end energy poverty, a showcase for entrepreneurs. Um, I'm Prachi. I'll be your host from IntelliCap for the session. And uh, we are awaiting a few more participants as we speak, but in the interest of time, we thought we should just uh, sort of go ahead and, and uh, start the session. Um, I'll uh, not waste a lot of time and I'll just hand over to our moderator for the day, Harry, uh, who is a principal at Open Capital Advisors to take the session forward and introduce uh, our speakers for the day and also introduce the energy catalyst that's uh, sponsoring uh, this session and, and also organizing it. Thank you. Over to you, Harry. Thank you very much, Prachi. And thank you everyone to, to joining today. As Prachi mentioned, uh, the session we're having today is called Innovation to End Energy Poverty, a showcase for entrepreneurs. As Prachi mentioned, my name is Harry Masters. I'm a principal at Open Capital Advisors, and we are one of the consortium member firms working under the Energy Catalyst Program, uh, which presents and sponsors uh, this event today. As many of you know, over 1 billion people lack access to affordable, clean, and modern energy services across the world. In addition to that, over another 1 billion people uh, have intermittent or low quality energy sources. Further to, further to that, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, over the last few years has drastically impacted economies across the world, particularly in countries with major energy access gaps, plunging millions into poverty and making it all the more important to focus our efforts on ensuring that all have adequate access to energy. Today, we will provide a space for entrepreneurs and innovators to showcase their work in developing solutions that tackle this immense challenge. We have six companies with us here today, and I will let them all introduce themselves shortly. They represent the diversity of companies supported under the, under the Energy Catalyst program, including technology innovators, software developers, and project developers as well. We will see presentations from each of them and then host a discussion following these presentations in which we're really hoping to engage with you all that have joined us here today. First off though, I would like to spend some time to introduce the Energy Catalyst Program. So Trust, if you could switch to the next slide, please. The program funded by Innovate UK and several other co-funders was developed to accelerate the innovation needed um, to increase energy access addressing those problems mentioned before. It has three main pillars, uh, the first of which is around uh, competition. And specifically, uh, the program provides grant funding to innovators in technology or business models. There have been seven rounds conducted to date and the eighth, is up, eighth round is upcoming. Uh, the second pillar is collaboration. The program also fosters collaboration. Uh, this is both in the upfront processes and also um, during the company acceleration support phases of the projects. And the point here is to bring together the right stakeholders for partnership to effectively implement on these projects. And so these can include the technology leads or the other on the ground implementers involved. And the third area of support is around acceleration. The program provides support to help companies fill gaps on their pathways to commercialization of their technologies or innovative business models. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So far, the Energy Catalyst Program has supported 345 projects and committed 140 million pounds. 60 million pounds specifically has gone to energy access with projects in areas that include biomass or bioenergy, energy storage, solar, mini grids, productive uses of energy, and smart grids, among other sector, uh, segments. This work spans 29 countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. All of these projects supporting those goals under Sustainable Development Goal 7, while also focusing on gender equality and inclusion. Next slide, please. So to support each one of these companies, we have uh, assembled a diverse consortium of partners uh, as mentioned, of which Open Capital is just one company supporting uh, the grant recipients under the Energy Catalyst program. We provide them with uh, a few different types of services, the first of which is tailored venture support. So this includes market analysis, strategy, business planning, technology and IP support, financial strategy and capital raising support, among other areas. 
The second area is knowledge management. Uh, this includes uh, supporting companies and hosting common interest groups, sharing and disseminating various insights and hosting events, including workshops and webinars and trainings. And finally, we have connections and, and resources. These include the development of commercialization guides, development of case studies, uh, hosting and facilitating events and introductions for the various companies that participate in the program. I think that's a good point to say that today we're hoping to foster some of these connections with you in the audience uh, to potential partners that might be involved in the planning or implementation of current or future projects under the program, or to investors that might want to know more about the businesses and figure out how they can support these businesses in scaling their innovations. We hope that all can learn more about the types of companies here, about the innovation that the Energy Catalyst program is promoting to support accelerating access to energy across Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. With that, we will now move ahead to some of the company presentations. We will have each of the participants to share about their companies. And we appreciate that all of the participants stick to um, a, a six minute timeline um, so that we can hear from everyone and ensure that there is time for discussion. Uh, Utsav will be managing the time, uh, thanks for that. Uh, and we'll be in touch directly with each of you about timing. And again, for the audience, we would love for you to engage uh, here with our speakers. Um, there is an open chat function here. So feel free to share any questions in the Q&A discussion and we'd be happy to bring those up during the Q&A session. So first up, we have a company called Gravitricity and I will hand it over to the team to introduce themselves and share their presentation about their innovation. Over to you. Thanks, Harry. Can you hear me all? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so, so Gravitricity is uh, developing a gravity-based uh, uh, energy storage system for deployment uh, in existing or, or new mine shafts. And it's a deceptively simple idea. Uh, under the ground, you have, oh, can we move on to the next slide? Uh, so, so under the ground of this schematic, you, you, you have uh, the, the shaft itself, you have large weights moving up and down the shaft, uh, and you have cables which are doing uh, the connection to the, to the top. Uh, and, uh, and above ground, you've got uh, one or more winches to pull the weight or weights to the top, and, and acting in reverse, those winches act like uh, generators, so generating electricity as the weight falls back down to the bottom of the shaft. <clears throat> to date, we've been a, a team of specialist mechanical uh, and electrical engineers. Um, so each of these components has been uh, thoroughly thought through in some detail. So for example, uh, we know the minimum depth and diameter of a mine, which would make the system viable. Uh, we have IP in the composition of the weight, which we anticipate could be as much as 500 tonnes. Uh, we've carefully uh, determined the specification and performance and capabilities of the cables. Uh, and have chosen a supplier which meets these requirements. Uh, and we know the number of cables uh, we need in order to give um, the, the, the cables a, a, an appropriate amount of redundancy. And at the top, um, clever gearing ratios uh, ensure that the generator is spinning uh, suitably fast, even when the weight is traveling down the shaft slowly. We've got guidance mechanisms and control mechanisms in order to ensure that the weight falls to the bottom of the shaft evenly. So there's more I could say on that side, but I think the overall message is that it's a, it's a carefully designed system. Uh, but although the engineering is impressive and any integration is novel, uh, the science isn't new. Gravity-based energy storage in the form of pumped hydro has been around for 100 years or more. Uh, and, and so the large majority of all energy storage systems across the world are gravity-based energy storage systems. Uh, next slide, please. We've come a long way. Uh, since 2017, uh, when we, we really got going, we've been awarded more than one million uh, pounds in grant funding and have received um, investments of over three and a half million pounds in, <clears throat> in equity funding. We filed seven patents across a number of different areas. Four of those have been granted um, and three are pending. And, and two uh, independent reviews of large scale energy storage systems uh, from Imperial College London have included uh, concluded that our system because of its longevity, because of its non-degradation in performance and other characteristics, is cheaper over a 25-year period uh, measured in dollars per megawatt hour 
than all competitor technologies, including flow batteries, including lithium ion, including uh, compressed air and so on. Uh, but probably most importantly, um, earlier this year, um, we successfully completed a concept demonstrator, which was installed uh, in the docks up in Edinburgh. Um, this was actually originally scheduled for 2020, but was put into 2021 because of COVID. Um, and, and, and it was up there for a, a number of months and was tested and tested relentlessly uh, across a number of different areas, uh, including mechanical system competence and safety systems and so on. <clears throat> but probably most importantly, we validated that we could respond to grid signals in less than a second, which opens up significant and lucrative market opportunities and the ability to con deliver continuous power from a multi-rate system. And so with that hugely important milestone under our belt, we're now actively focused on building our first full-scale, first-of-a-kind commercial project. Uh, we're evaluating potential sites with front runners in Czech Republic and Poland. And as I say, we're, we're actively engaged in making that happen. I'm um, looking, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so looking forward, we've identified four different use cases uh, in the industrial decarbonization space, um, in, in balancing services, in energy access and mini grids, and in a co-location of the energy storage system with, with large scale solar. And, and clearly, obviously, the, the market dynamics and the customer requirements, and therefore the storage system that we're looking to, uh, to, to provide to each one of those markets is, is different and going to be configured differently. Um, but it, uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of, of, of where we're looking to, to focus. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, uh, a quick discussion on uh, mini grids and, and a bit of a deep dive on that. Um, we as an organization are really passionate about this. It, it's not just a, a casual add-on. Um, top team alone had over 60 uh, years of experience in low carbon innovation and energy access markets. And we're really excited about the potential of our system in this sector. Um, so one parting thought, one of the things we're excited about is the ability to, to add energy storage to this. And there's an interesting parallel here with Telco. Um, the developed world has had a landline phones for many years before moving to cellular, but the developing world has gone in an incredibly short space of time from no phones to mobile phones. And so leapfrogging effectively the, the landline stage. And I think similarly, there is a parallel here with energy. Uh, the developed world faces challenge incorporating uh, storage and intimacy in, uh, in, in intermittency into a system which was designed and built for different a uh, different paradigm and here too the world the developing world could could look to effectively step aside from these challenges so the opportunity to embed i think energy storage into grid systems from the ground up is a very exciting one uh, and we're very much looking forward to being part of that journey uh, that's that's all i wanted to say thanks harry Thank you very much, Robin, uh, for sharing more uh, about the, the opportunity, opportunity here um, in your gravity-based system, and congratulations on, on all the progress that's being made. With that, we'd like to, to hand it over to Emily at Oxto to share her presentation. Emily, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Robin, as well. That was really interesting to hear. Um, so, yeah, so my name's Emily. Um, I'm joining from Oxo Energy. We are um, a relatively small business based in Guildford in Surrey, um, which is just outside of London in the United Kingdom. Uh, we are a team of ambitious and innovative engineers with a shared belief that access to a reliable electricity supply shouldn't be a privilege, as I'm sure we will agree. Um, our technology falls under the umbrella of energy storage but we think that power storage is a slightly better term to describe our devices. Um, energy storage, power storage, and other smart energy systems are, in my unbiased opinion, likely to be the key enabling devices in facilitating the clean energy transition. At Oxo Energy, we create flywheel energy storage systems. So thinking about applications for our product in the global south, we consider problems like size constrained grids and unreliable power networks, particularly in fast growing economies where the demand for the electricity is high. And even in rural areas where unreliable power networks can leave towns without electricity for days, 
the OXO flywheel system can provide not only a solution that stores energy from renewables or excess grid supply, but it can be a solution that guarantees a reliable electricity supply and can slot into the existing power network and empower these existing power networks with the flexibility to include intermittent renewable energy sources within their existing structure. Um, okay, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in the top right, you can see this is one of our systems. Um, this is from our pilot project in Nice. So we've been going around since, we've been around since 2015 um, and from kind of 2015 to 2019, it's been mostly R&D and we began to commercialize in 2019. So this was our first project. Um, it was a project with IMRED at the University Côte d'Azur um, and with the help of our local partners in France, we delivered a 55, 65 kilowatt flywheel system there. This is our current standard size a system. Um, and this is going to sit within an ecosystem that includes lithium ion batteries, PV, second life batteries and EV chargers as well. So this is an IRIS smart city project where the flywheel is going to be tested on a number of different grid stabilization scenarios. Similarly, in the top left, we have a snippet from a project in Canada. Again, our flywheel is going to be sitting within a hybrid system, but this time focusing on renewable integration into a rural microgrid. So these two projects mostly showcase um, our applications in grid stabilization and renewable integration, um, which I would say are probably where we see the most traction, but also in our UPS systems um, for industrial applications. So our biggest project so far um, is a UPS application in, at a tea factory in Kenya. So this is the lower picture just on the right hand side. And here we're going to be installing a 650 kilowatt flywheel system. So this is going to be like a plug and play kind of turnkey style container containing 10 individual flywheels. And that's another benefit of our systems is, is that you can add and, and minus flywheels depending on how much you need and, and your, your specific requirements. So Kenya is another hybrid system as well. Um, the flywheels are going to be operating with solar, wind and diesel generators. So if the power drops from the main power supply, whether that's from the grid or coming from solar, power will be drawn from all other available sources before going to the diesel generator. So saving the client a lot of money um, compared to how they were how they were working on before. Um, and again, this project in Kenya, this is um, with the assistance of a local partner, um, Aria Finergy, and they are an energy company based in Kenya. Um, working with local partners um, if you want to go to the next slide please working with local partners is where we see most of our business developing over the next few years um, since commercializing in 2019 for the last two years or so the majority of our pipeline has been made up of inbound inquiries um, we do get a lot of traction especially from industrial clients um, and as we look to grow the business for the next year or so local partners we think are a fantastic gateway to accessing serial commissions from customers within that market. Our commission in Kenya, once delivered, um, our local partner is going to be supplying us with more products that are contingent on, on the delivery of the first projects. So that's where we kind of see our reach market heading over the next few years. Um, and then I will just drop a little bit about our, our funding round. So we are just about to close our first seed round on Cedars. Please feel free to go and check it out at some point. Um, this, um, this seed round is going towards recruitment of senior engineers to help us optimize the facility, optimize the, the flywheel itself, and also um, expand a little bit in terms of our capabilities. Next, after we close this round, we're going to be moving straight into a Series A round. And this is again going to be focusing on recruitment to expand our team to be able to deliver on the projects that we have inbound. Um, yeah, and then a little bit further in the future, um, licensing is a fantastic opportunity and avenue that we are really looking to explore. Um, and that's kind of where we see the future of the business going because it provides customers and clients with a way to 
access our machinery without having to pay the entire cost up front. And where our mechanical batteries don't experience the same degradation as, for example, a lithium ion battery, we can do licensing for 10 years and have maybe two or three customers using the exact same product within the lifespan of one flywheel. So thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go into a little bit more of a discussion later, but thank you very much for listening to what I had to say about, about what we do. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing more about your storage solution. I'm exciting to see multiple innovations in the space here. And it will definitely be interesting to, to come back and discuss some of these context, in context with some of the other energy storage solutions available on the market or, or coming online, or even those uh, also on the call here. So looking forward to that. With that, uh, I will hand it over to Vanessa at Buffalo Grid. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Harry. Um, could we go to the first slide? I think, I don't, can you guys see me? Because I'm not, I can't see where I am, but that might've been me, but we can just start anyway. There's no need to see me. The important is the context. So a pleasure to be here and thank you everyone for having us. So we at Buffalo Grid work on another um, angle or another side of energy poverty. And that is the impact that energy poverty has on connectivity. So if we look at, or just consider the fact that six years ago, about a third of the world's population was using mobile internet, but that today it's more than half, it's a, quite a remarkable leap. But if we consider that still 3.8 billion of those people, so half of the world's population have never experienced the internet. It's quite a, a shocking concept when we know that um, at least, 3.8 billion of them or 3.6 billion of them live in places where there is already three and 4G. So when we look at solutions for connectivity, it isn't a question of satellites or heavy infrastructure of broadband. It's more a question of four main barriers to entry. And one of them actually revolves around access to power. So the first main um, barrier to entry is affordability people in these markets cannot afford mobile data. It's normally very, very expensive, except in the case of, of India. Um, the other one is digital skills. There is an extreme lack of digital skills across the board, which are not really helping um, people come onto the digital ladder, ladder. The other very important thing to notice is the lack of relevant content. So in order to gain skills, digital skills, education, uh, financial skills, the content is essential. And once people gain access to the internet, sometimes they're over, um, overwhelmed or bombarded with, let's say, social media or different kind of platforms that have a great commercial um, benefit from connecting them, but yet again, not really a, a positive impact on them. And the last one is obviously infrastructure. So the, without access to power to charge your phone or your mobile device in the form of a tablet, you really cannot get connected. So what do we do at Buffalo Grid? We have developed after many, many years of trials and testing on the ground, uh, where we started in Africa and subsequently did a lot of R&D in India up until 2019, created the Stream Spot Plus, which is a solar powered, you can see the, the, the hub uh, as we call them here, solar powered. So we connect to an 80 watt solar panel. We deploy them in places that have high population density, and uh, high mobile phone penetration, but uh, uh, low connectivity. So solar powered, we're already removing that final barrier of infrastructure. They are mobile network enabled, meaning that even in places where there's three or 4G, we can update all of the content. The hubs are deployed uh, preloaded with content in four different verticals. So we have education, health, entertainment and sport. And we constantly update all of this content using our cloud uh, through the mobile network that exists in a region. And then very simply our users come to the hub, connect to the offline Wi-Fi. They can download the app for free from the hub itself. So there's absolutely no need for any expenditure in becoming connected or having access to digital content and services. And then they can stream for free and charge their phones for free through the hubs. 
Um, we've got next, so we can't, we're constantly updating and we can manage our content. And then this content, the usage, the cloud will give us reports of, of metrics and data. So we can actually learn a lot about um, uh, users and groups of people that we know very little of or almost nothing about. So it's a, it's a very simple um, uh, system that we have developed. Can we please go to the other slide, the next slide? Thank you. So as I mentioned, we work in places where there is a high population density. So we're looking at peri-urban areas in places like Bangladesh and Nigeria, where we are already working and we will be developing commercially. Well, we've already got test hubs there and we're going to be having our first larger scale deployment later this year. Um, and then we're also working in refugee camps in Uganda and in Kenya. So we are going to be uh, deploying in VDBD camp, which a lot of you might know, there is a, a huge infrastructural problem, but connectivity is essential. If we think about the fact that in the last uh, 18 months with COVID, most of us were connected now, managed to continue working, but most importantly, our children were able to continue in education. With units like this, people can continue education, gather digital skills, uh, we can bring all sorts of content. So within our different uh, verticals of content, we've got um, our education system, which does, doesn't just bring the national curriculum or the syllabus that a country might ask for, but we're also providing additional learning. So we can provide things from the open university or different uh, language learning systems, coding for children, um, uh, Sesame Street for children as well, but we can go as far as entrepreneurial skills, entrepreneurial practices through systems as this. So we do focus on all of those verticals, but one of the very interesting things about um, the hubs what it can do is depending on the content that we bring, we actually comply with 14 of the 17 UN sustainability goals. So through the content or direct engagement. Um, uh, we've got three different revenue streams. So one is our direct commercial deployments that we do ourselves. The second one is our humanitarian donation model, which we, we, we deploy at a cost, uh, the service with a prepaid uh, hosting service. And that gets deployed in places like refugee camps. And the final one is a franchise revenue share where we're starting to work in places like Turkey, where we wouldn't personally go in and do our own deployment, but there is an interesting market and there are groups of, or partners who have invited us to go in there. Um, we have raised so far 3 million pounds in equity and have received 3 million pounds in grants since the, the company started as a research project, as I said. Um, it actually started as a project to charge phones for farm, coffee farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. And that is the origins of the name of the company, because one of the things that somebody said when they were charging phones for coffee farmers was that buffaloes charge anything. So the company was named Buffalo Grid, but in, in recent months, we have found that uh, there is a certain cultural connotation when we were doing all of our R&D in India it wasn't really relevant or made sense. So we have recently renamed our service, the Stream Spot Plus, which basically tells a, a person what the service does. So this, you can stream from the hub or download from the hub. And the plus right now refers to the charging services, but in the near future, we will be bringing other types of services like commercial services for different communities. Um, uh, we can run surveys and find things and information, not just for commercial partners, but for, in, for impact partners, uh, for, for health, for any, uh, the hubs can be really used. It's almost a white canvas to really support sustainable development in different communities. Um, I think that's pretty much it for us. Um, we'd love to hear what questions you might have. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And I think you've discussed something really important um, the Buffalo Grid is doing. Um, I, it's, I think it's important to note that the provision of energy just doesn't just provide kilowatt hours or BTUs. Uh, it also provides essential services um, um, to support you know, the populations that do have access to that electricity. 
So, so thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, absolutely. With that, we'll move it on to our colleagues at Opioid Technologies. Emily, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, so if we can get on the first slide, thank you. So um, thank you so much for having us um, on this panel. It's not our first time at Ten Cloud, but um, it's always great to be here. Um, so my name is Emily Trenbulakia. I'm the impact lead at UPIA. UPIA was founded uh, in 2017, um, and we're uh, a SaaS CRM provider, uh, initially designed for, um, um, for last mile distributors in the solar industry. Um, we are now a platform for your distribution business. So if you sell anything in the last mile uh, and you want or need to digitize um, your business, uh, you know, if it's in water, cooking, uh, agriculture, services, um, of course, energy and entertainment, um, then chances are we can we can help you. Um, so uh, if we can move to the first slide, uh, the second slide, sorry. Um, so what makes UPIA innovative? Uh, two things mainly. Firstly, it's affordability. And secondly, it's flexibility. Um, so we basically, um, we basically adapt uh, our platform to your business model and not the other way around. Uh, we're also modular, which means we can provide a holistic solution uh, to your needs. So some of our clients, which are further down, um, further down the road uh, in their digitization journey can have our supply chain platform. Some others can have the client space. But of course, everything speaks to each other. Um, so um, I, I just want to really quickly talk about um, our project we had with Energy Catalyst because it has really been a great partner for us. So the most recent project we had was uh, with the last mile distributor in Kenya, Give What? Uh, it was in Kaliti, Eastern Kenya, and we developed uh, an innovative business model um, by using crowdfunding to bring energy to people who are closer to the bottom of the pyramid. So helping them, um, you know, get and continues their journey on the energy ladder. Um, so yeah, there's, there's actually a great video done by a uh, story by design, which was in one of your slides, um, Harry, as a partner to Energy Catalyst uh, about the project itself um, on, on our YouTube channel if you want to check it out. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so it started four years ago. Uh, we were in Kenya, Tanzania, and East Africa, uh, we expanded quite rapidly. Um, we, our global reach now goes across Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, Southeast Asia, and India. Uh, so again, if you're anywhere in these regions or further away, um, you know, and uh, whatever business model you, you, you have, uh, you know, do, do come and speak with us because this is the extent of the, the flexibility um, of the software. Um, so we started with solar and some of our, some of our key uh, partners, our clients in this industry, but we now um, work across multiple verticals because of the flexibility um, of the software. So I can take you through a couple of use cases um, in the next slide. Uh, okay, so carbon offset uh, project. So for this client, our platform is really about tracking uh, and reporting deployment. Um, so being able to scale deployment and provide unequivocal proof of deployment to the different stakeholders uh, in carbon offset projects. So tracking uh, from the time the unit leaves the factory until they reach the hand of um, the end users, uh, and then all of the data collection that is that is needed, uh, uh, which which is usually quite a lot. Um, and so. Our data collection functionalities have checks and balances to make sure that the quality, that the data is of, of really high quality uh, and reliable. Um, and so you get data collection at uh, onboarding when the units are uh, sold or distributed, um, and then later on for surveys. Um, the platform is also about all of the internal audit processes. Um, so that's one of the use cases. Then we have uh, grouping. So this is. Um, the project I just mentioned with Energy Catalyst, whereby we we basically um, 
provide risk management tools to distributors so that their overall risk um, remains the same. But then within different portfolios, you would have um, individually uh, clients which have a riskier profile. So clients which typically would not be able to enter into a, a pay-go deal uh, for a solar home system, as an example. Um, and then we also see usage as a service, um, as, as something that is coming more and more. Uh, so for instance, immobility. Uh, their tracking is very important because you know the batteries uh, are gonna continuously change hands. So you need to know which battery is in which location, which battery is in the hand of which client, um, also the ability to take a multitude of very small payments every day. Um, also in farming, for instance, we see farmers uh, producing more uh, in, in, in using a pay per usage um, model. So they only pay when they use uh, the equipment. Um, so I think that was mentioned before in the first presentation, but exactly as, uh, yeah, as Africa has leaked from um, landline, um, uh, landline infrastructure uh, by using um, by using mobile phones, we see that they're probably gonna gonna leapfrog ownership uh, by by renting more. Um, so yes, that I think that was um, that was mainly my short presentation. So I look forward to um, taking your questions later. Thank you, Harris. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, and um, great to see the, the innovation here uh, around math, last mile distribution, um, understanding that digitization is really helping um, bring a lot more insight, um, tracking, monitoring, et cetera. Um, and how this is particularly important for, for the energy sector uh, as distribution, particularly for small scale systems uh, is, is vital. Uh, with that, uh, we're actually moving to, uh, I think, uh, rather different use case here. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to, to the team at Carnot and Francis. Uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. So over to you. Thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Francis Lemp, co-founder and uh, director of equity raising and business development at Carnot. Um, and to start off with, I'd like to actually take everyone back to 1824 uh, when Monsieur Carnot worked out that the maximum theoretical efficiency engines can achieve was 85%. And now if we fast forward 200 years, the average efficiency engines are achieving is less than half of that. So I'd like to introduce you to our technology, which brings this up to a game changing 70% fuel efficiency. The global transition to net zero means that we need to start radically rethinking the way that we're generating and storing energy. And there are currently no production ready alternatives to engines for very large and long range applications, such as trucks, ships and generators. So we've invented an engine that goes further, cleaner and smarter and by operating on hydrogen and biofuels can revolutionize some of the most challenging industries to decarbonize and bring clean and affordable energy to all. Um, so what is the key issue with modern engines and, and why are they so inefficient? If you could go to the next slide, please. Well, modern engines will waste on average uh, one third of fuel to cooling systems that stop metallic components from melting. We're developing engines with key components manufactured from ceramics, able to withstand fuel combustion temperatures, eliminating the need for cooling systems and therefore doubling efficiencies. And with double efficiency, Carnot engines can half the fuel costs, reduce the total cost of ownership of engines by an average of 35% across our target markets. Crucially though, our vision is to drive our target markets to net zero emissions through mass adoption of our clean engines. And in order to facilitate this transition, our engines will also be able to operate on hydrocarbons halving emissions along the way. Transitioning to net zero will then be achieved by simply swapping out the fuel delivery system to run on hydrogen and biofuels while the core engine remains the same. Next slide, please. Um, so we've assembled a Formula One derived team capable of an extremely high pace of development. And we've gone from concept to prototype in under a year, which is unprecedented in our industry. 
Since launching in 2019, uh, we've had a number of achievements. You know, we've been awarded over a total of 900,000 in government grant funds. That includes two Innovate UK projects and the Eureka Eurostars one. Uh, we've raised over a million in pre-seed and seed funding. Uh, won a place on the UK Oil and Gas Technology Centre for Net Zero, with, partnered with BP and Equinor, filed our international PCTs and UK patents, formed strategic relationships, including with Fraunhofer, which is the world's leading research institute in, on ceramics, uh, completed our Energy Catalyst 7 project, uh, where we developed an energy access solution for Ethiopia, identified key low barrier market entry points through customer validation for pilot testing. Uh, and these are off-grid power generation for sub-Saharan Africa and marine vessel auxiliary power units. And for these low barrier market points, we've, we've already got partners ready to carry out pilot trials. Um, and we've also attained expressions of interest from industry, and that includes an OEM, an EU vessel operator, mini grid developer, and a genset manufacturer. Next slide, please. Uh, so during our Energy Catalyst 7 grant, uh, we partnered with the Michele Ethiopian Institute of Technology to develop a game-changing genset that would increase the affordability and accessibility of energy in rural communities of the Tigray region. Uh, together, we carried out a feasibility study and developed a business model for operating our engine on locally sourced biofuels. We identified small communities that had no access to the national grid uh, and had a heavy reliance on burning of wood, uh, wood fuel and charcoal. Um, and to meet their power demands with a clean solution, these communities preferred to adopt either a mini grid or biofuel biogas generator technology over uh, a solar or wind based solution. So we developed um, a Jatrafa powered uh, generator to meet the power requirements, um, along with a supply chain model and cooperative run business model for the purchase and running of these um, community gensets. Um, so we plan to explore and trial our engines across the wider sub-Saharan African market, uh, including both rural and urban applications. Uh, and we aim to be the go-to technology for backup generators in the new mini grid developments. Um, so our momentum is building uh, and we'd be delighted for you to join us on our journey to move further, cleaner and smarter. Uh, we really appreciate your time and the opportunity to present. And you know, please uh, ask me any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis, and really excited about the potential with with Carno there and, you know, not just looking at brand new solutions and, and use cases, but taking what's a, a very old use case, uh, 1800s, um, and finding better ways and more efficient ways to um, to address those use cases. With that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to to Yash at Orcs at Grid. Uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. Perfect, Harry. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure being here introducing my company, Oxigrid. Um, we're, we're a four-year-old startup um, based in, in London and India. I, I myself am based in, in India. My co-founder is here in the UK. Uh, we're focused on making IoT sensors and, and an analytics platform for energy optimization. Um, our, our core markets are, are the energy distribution network operators. So, so we work very closely with, with grid operators, but um, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's just, I think just switched. I'm sorry, so, I, so we work very closely with grid operators, but with also with, with large energy consumers um, to, to help them to understand if the, the grid infrastructure is working efficiently or if there are any, um, any, any losses or, or issues in the network wherein we could um, you know, improve, improve the overall performance of the network. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So to 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 give an overview of the uh, the challenge that that we're we're trying to address, um, our focus is uh, is is that energy companies or the the issue that we see is that energy companies globally are facing increasing challenges um, in in getting access to to sustainable, affordable, and reliable electricity. Um, I noticed also in the chat that there were there were some questions about uh, on this topic. Um, even though if renewables are um, are becoming cost parity with with fossil fuels, there's there's still the, the there's still challenges of how do we move uh, from 10% or 20% renewable penetration to 100%. Uh, 
uh, penetration with you know with all the the grid balancing issues and and so on. Um, so with that, uh, that's that's the first challenge that that we noticed that in sustainability, um, integrating low carbon technologies uh, increases risks of failures and losses on the uh, the utility infrastructure. Uh, this is mainly around around the fact that the 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 the, the grid infra was built in the early 1900s. And it was designed for for unidirectional flow of power from large generating stations uh, to the consumers. But you know, as the situation is changing, now it's it's becoming more and more um, uh, difficult for the grid operators to uh, to manage the infra um, in, in in that sense. Um, of course, a, the the second challenge around affordability. This is more uh, more interesting in you know, in, in my home country, in, in India, as well as other developing nations, uh, where there's a lot of misuse and mismanagement of, of grid networks, uh, leading to almost uh, $90 billion globally, um, annually, sorry, per, per year, uh, in, in energy losses, whether it's in theft or just technical losses and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's another big challenge that, that the utilities are facing. And then finally, there's the issue of reliability. Um, these, these concerns are grow, uh, are, are are around you know growing demand from uh, from electrification of other industries you know whether it's transportation or just electrification of of rural populations that are are not connected to the grid at this stage. Um, so with these three, uh, sorry, next next slide. So with these challenges, um, uh, we at Oxigrid we we thought that you know there has to be a better way at at managing the infrastructure, and we came up with something called the Grid Analytics Platform. Um, so the grid analytics platform is, is a real-time multi-node uh, monitoring system with, with advanced algorithms to optimize assets and improve efficiency. Um, so the, the system is organized in, in three layers. Uh, the first layer is, is, is our IoT uh, uh, sensors um, or, the, or the data acquisition layer. Um, we've, we've designed um, uh, our, our units, which are called Seed, STEM, and SLS. Um, these are these are Wi-Fi and cellular-based retrofit-enabled sensors that, that are installed on um, energy feeders, power transformers, circuit breakers, and and other infrastructure on the utility um, um, points. Um, the the idea is that we we acquire data if there is data not available with the customer, um, and of course if there are um, legacy units, whether they're, they're they're RTUs or relays, if they're already installed on the network, communicable, then we just integrate with with their data sources over um, over in uh, industry standard protocols, you know, whether it's Modbus or IEC one hundred four, and so on. So once we have the data coming into our our cloud platform. Um, then, then that's why we, we 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 deploy our our energy algorithms. These these um, these machine learning based analytics are all designed in house with with our data science team, um, and they are focused on three major per, uh, verticals. Um, the first set of algorithms are focused on on asset optimization. So these are uh, focused on on ensuring that the assets are running held in in a very healthy condition. Um, the second one is around energy losses and um, uh, and energy efficiency. And finally, the third set is set is around uh, outage reductions. Um, so once once we have this data coming in, then finally we have a, a, a data dissemination layer. That's that's it's a web SCADA platform um, where it's it's very simplistic driven. There's there's alerts and um, you know whether they're SMS or email alerts to understand if there are issues or any improvements that can be done on on the network. Uh, next slide, please. So with this, uh, what is it that we have achieved so far? So uh, we started in, in 2017. We've, uh, we've raised through Innovate UK and other um, uh, grant, um, equity-free grant uh, grants about for 500,000 pounds so far. Um, and with that, we've managed to build a completely patented system in the UK um, that's from the sensors to, to the platform and the analytics. Uh, we've deployed our system at scale uh, so far, so mainly we've had a lot of traction in in India. Uh, we're monitoring um, electricity supply to three major states. So this is uh, these are five-year contracts um, with an OPEX-based revenue model, where um, the customer is paying for the data that they uh, get and the insights that we are generating. So so we bear the the capital cost of installing our sensors. Um, we have about 2,500 plus energy nodes that we're monitoring right now in, in real-time basis. And um, yeah, 
and and we've also had corporate partnership with Schneider to build some of the um, the asset health analytics. Um, we, we've collaborated with universities in the UK and in India. Uh, in the UK, we work with University of Reading um, uh, as one of the, the Innovate UK partners uh, to develop um, other analytics. Um, and then, yeah, and we've also won a few awards with in and, and conference participation as well. Um, yeah, and next slide, I think. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's it from my side. Um, really looking forward to, to you know working with more local partners in, in countries to to work towards a more reliable, affordable, and and sustainable energy uh, for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yas. And it was great to to hear about your work uh, potentially with uh, more utilities in this space. I think when we discuss energy access, a lot of the conversation does end up revolving around. Uh, off-grid energy sources, um, but of course, uh, successful um, expansion of, of the current utilities and also further development of their sustainability will also be vital um, on our pathway to, to universal electricity access. Um, so I really appreciate that. And with that, we come to the end of our presentation today. So thanks again to, um, to all of the presenters uh, for sharing more about their businesses We'll now shift, if we could jump to the next slide. Uh, we've mentioned a panel discussion here, um, but we have just under 40 minutes. So what I propose is that uh, we have a combination panel discussion and audience Q&A uh, session here. Uh, I have been taking note of the, the questions that have been coming through from the audience. So thank you all so much for submitting those and please do just keep um, submitting those questions as we go along. Um, so, uh, I would like to, to start jumping into some of these. And yes, yeah, thanks for already addressing uh, in part uh, one of the questions around uh, integration of renewables um, comparison to, to other technologies as well. That was great. Uh, so with that, uh, my, first, uh, my first question is actually for uh, the team at Oxo, Emily. Uh, a couple of questions ended up coming um, this way. Um, so, um, there were a few questions here. I think a couple clarification ones that might be helpful for the audience. Um, the audience asks, is, is Oxo a pro product company? Uh, and then also, what else makes the product superior and competitive? Good questions, good questions. Um, yes, so we are a product company. Um, so we produce and we sell um, our flywheels. They are designed, manufactured in-house at present. Um, what makes our solution different? So flywheels and something that I think is quite a common theme among a lot of the presentations here today, a lot of these um, technologies are actually quite old concepts, but they've been made new for modern applications. So flywheels are, are the same situation. They're a relatively old concept, um, but they've been commercialized and, and we are um, making them for one application. So um, our founder, George, Dr. George Prasnos, um, he was working in satellite and space applications for about 15 years in his early career, working with NASA and the ESA. And it was those technologies that he was working on there that he brought back with him to develop and found Oxdo. And that is the IP that founds the kind of basis of the flywheel. Um, one of the key differentiating factors of our flywheel compared to other flywheel um, energy storage solutions is our consideration of safety into the design of the flywheel. So it's if you know if you know a little bit about flywheels, um, you might have seen in the news things can go wrong. Um, there's so much energy um, that builds up, and if that's all released at once, it can be pretty catastrophic. So um, the way our, our rotor is designed as one component made up in, in individual laminations rather than as a one piece component. So in the unlikely event of a failure, the, um, the energy is released in a cascading effect rather than in an all at once explosion. So we are able to therefore store the flywheels above ground, reducing installation, reducing maintenance as well, um, compared to other flywheel companies who have to bury the machine below the ground in case of um, an explosion or something like that. So the safety aspect is definitely a key differentiating factor um, comparing our flywheel with other flywheel batteries. 
um, compared to other energy storage solutions, thinking about like lithium ion batteries. Um, it's hard to compare because we really target different applications. Um, we get a lot of questions kind of asking us, particularly in, in our Cedars crowdfund, um, asking us kind of to compare our flywheel with the Tesla Powerwall, for example, but they're really not comparable because, because we are a mechanical battery, we don't experience degradation, we have a four millisecond discharge time, we can have unlimited discharge and, and charging cycles compared to a lithium ion battery where you would see a, a really high level of degradation. So we don't compete in the same market really. Um, we prefer to work as a hybrid solution, which is what the majority of our projects are um, because it makes it easier to kind of work together rather than trying to um, change everything entirely. We just slot in to existing systems and increase the life cycle of those batteries um, and stability um, and the power conditioning. Sorry, I know that was a relatively long answer um, for the question, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate that. And while we're on the topic of uh, not always being able to compare solutions, uh, I would be interested to hear from the Gravitricity team. Uh, so Robin, I was hoping, uh, I was wondering if you could also tell us a little bit more about some of the benefits about the Gravitricity system? And again, uh, how does this compare to some of those competing technologies in this space? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And um, I mean, I, I would, I would to some extent um, echo Emily's comments about um, different, different horses for courses and, and different energy storage systems for different applications. In particular, you've got um, high power duration applications and then and then longer duration systems and, and the and the profiles of those and the market dynamics and 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 so on are, are very very different um but we we we, we at gravitricity we, we we consider that longevity um and attractive academics is at the heart of our proposition and there are a number of components to that so um we've got a system that delivers a, a, a pretty market leading um, energy efficiency of, of around 85%. So 85% of the energy you put into the system, you get out as usable energy. Um, and then you've got consistent performance uh, through the lifetime of the, of the facility. Um, and that efficiency won't degrade over time. Um, anybody who has a mobile phone knows that um, uh, lithium ion batteries do degrade over time. And that's something that our system manages to avoid. Um, there are no standing losses. So when the weight is at the top of the shaft, it can sit there pretty much forever um, and not to lose any of the potential energy it's got. There are no parasitic loads. Um, so for example, air conditioning systems, which are needed for lithium ion type applications. Um, and, and, and so for example, yeah. So, so for all those reasons, um, from a quantitative business case point of view, um, uh, we, we we think that we've got a pretty compelling proposition. Uh, and then you add other elements. So for example, we don't have to mine for um, lithium or, or other products, which in itself causes uh, environmental damage. And there's no explosive chemical risk as, as well. So, 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 so there's some of those things which uh, feed into a direct business case um, and others which are less easy to quantify, um, but we, we believe you know, uh, also feed into a, a sort of a more rounded um, uh, business case for, uh, for, for for deployment. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Rob. And of course, you know, energy storage will, will continue and increasingly be important, particularly as we look at incorporating all the various um, forms of, of energy generation um, onto our grid. Um, per the question that was mentioned about potential challenges in, in the space. There was a, another clarification, uh, clarification for, uh, I believe, Vanessa uh, at Buffalo Grid. Uh, there was one question from the audience um, asking specifically, I think if you could um, just delve a little bit deeper into the business model. Uh, the question posed was, what is the benefit that is accrued to the commercial users uh, of the Stream Spot Plus system? Um, given that the service is free of cost to yep. some of those end users. Yes. So in a commercial deployment, the way that it works, uh, well, first of all, I need to clarify that uh, we don't cannibalize the, the, the users or the customers of the mobile network. 
uh, or the mobile network operators. It, in the, on the other hand, we're bringing in users who would not normally or be, be organic uh, users in the time frame that one would that we can bring them in. The benefits to so we align the interest of all of the parties involved. The benefits, first of all, for so the hubs are located in agent locations. So where the mobile network operators sell uh, SIM cards, mom and pop shops, those sorts of things. All of the shop owners throughout our trials consistently reported a 50% increase in revenues whilst they were hosting a hub in their, in their shops. Naturally, because people came, they're charging their phones, they were spending 20, 30 minutes there, they bought more airtime because they had more charge and they bought more things from the shop whilst they were there. So that was a great benefit for the shop holder. Um, the access to charge and the access to content for the user, the end user itself, and for the mobile network operator on the exclusive services, we actually saw an 11% conversion rate to that MNO so people could access the service. So there's benefits across the board to all the parties involved. Also in our commercial deployments, it's important to mention that the charge and the streaming when connected to the hub or near the hub are free. But in our deployments in Bangladesh and in Nigeria, right now, those are our commercial deployments, we actually charge a very affordable $1 per month to download and take all of this content away. So all of the education and health content is always for free streaming or downloading because that's part of our commitment to support sustainable development. But entertainment and sport, meaning the soccer match from the Nigerian Premier Football League or from the cricket match, uh, depending on where we are, or the latest series or some of the classical movies, to be able to watch it at home or to watch it on the go, you pay a dollar per month. So a lot of our user base also is not necessarily on a contract basis who can pay $1 per month, but we can also work with pay-as-you-go customers who can pay 25 cents per week. So our system, we also have a patent uh, granted for our cashless unlocking system that facilitates all, the, all of the transactions required for the service to work. Um, I think that might have answered that question, Harry. Is there anything that I need to elaborate a little bit more on, do you think? No, I think that's helpful. Uh, thank you for the responses Great. there. Thank you. We, we had another question come up um, specifically for, for Yash at Orca Grid. Uh, I was, the question specifically is, how does the company see the technology evolve uh, with increased implementation of prepaid meters? I understand that you already can integrate um, with a variety of um, hardware, but curious if you could elaborate on that, please. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, so I was, I was just thinking in my mind as well about this. Um, so the first, uh, yes. So, so the first point, I mean, yes, we can, we do have uh, uh, DLMS support in, in the system. So we integrate, we can integrate meter data, uh, you know, mainly smart meter data into the system. And uh, this, the, the meter data is mainly used for, by us for, for demand forecasting uh, so that we have a better understanding of uh, the demand requirements that thereby enabling um, you know, energy efficiency um, um, uh, recommendations to, to the utility. Um, having said that, the second point is that we at this stage are not working with consumer meters specifically because there's also the issues about privacy and, you know, just the deployment uh, uh, scale or, the, or the, the speed of deployment on, on consumer smart meters. So we focused our energies more on uh, transformer meter. So we'd look at aggregated data sets and thereby be able to estimate what's happening in a locality or, or in an area. Um, but yeah, but to, 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 to answer this question specifically about prepaid meters, um, I think the, the more interesting part would be if we start integrating prepaid meter data, we can have a better forecasting understanding of you know when these meters are going to be um, cut off or when the prepaid will 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 basically get go down to zero and thereby understanding where that entire demand will 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 go off right so that we can have a better understanding of energy efficiency over a month one month period instead of doing a day ahead or or two days ahead kind of a thing so it will help to understand a longer um, time cycle that's that's what I think. Yeah. Thanks much for that, Yes, I appreciate it. I wanted to, to shift gears and 
um, talk about a, a slightly different topic. Um, Emily um, from Opia, you had mentioned that you support with um, carbon offset um, programs uh, or the organizations that, that take part there. Uh, I understand that this is, you know, is a growing uh, space and will continue to grow over time, particularly as there's more attention uh, around climate and how to address the climate issue. Uh, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit more about how exactly you're currently serving that market and what use cases and how you also see that evolving over time? Sure. So, um, so for instance, cook stove is a, is a you know, very typical example of um, a carbon offset project, right? So um, the carbon credit payers are going to uh, finance distribution um, uh, or, you know, subsidize it very heavily of clean cook stove, which is going to take CO2 out of uh, and not being emitted. Um, and so these these um, projects, they are governed by a set of rules, which is very strict. Uh, so the design, the implementation of the project has to follow, uh, you know, um, you know, a certain set of rules set up by some independent administrative bodies, such as the Gold Standard or Vera. Um, and what it means is that uh, there's a lot that, um, whoever's going to deploy these units will have to document. And so we support them with that. Um, so whenever a unit has been deployed, um, you know, we can track it if it's been exchanged, if it's been replaced. Um, if, if they added three more um, units to the client, uh, we, we'll know all of that. And then there's a, it's a very heavy um, component of data collection. So for instance, some of the projects require four pictures. Uh, per deployed asset. So you end up having agents that have to upload hundreds and hundreds of photos uh, on a daily basis. So our mobile app is designed so that, um, you know, the pictures are of good quality enough, but a very low data. Uh, so that's very important for them. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so this is definitely, uh, I mean, uh, as I said, we started, you know, in the solar industry, but we're having more and more clients in the space um, of the carbon credit uh, project because uh, well, there is so much to be done. So there's still 3 billion people clicking on open fire. So uh, there is a lot of room for growth in that market and we see our clients scaling uh, at a pace which is really quite, um, quite extraordinary, um, actually. Yeah, thank you for that. I think uh, it's interesting how you're bringing this technology um, to some of these last mile areas, um, supporting with their data tracking to comply with these programs. Uh, I, I wanted to, to ask a question uh, along similar lines, perhaps to, to Francis um, uh, at Carno. So uh, I'm curious to know, uh, particularly in thinking about, you know, how we're reaching um, some of these lower access regions um, you mentioned some of the projects um, that you have ongoing, which are great to hear. Uh, so uh, how will end users in some of these lower or harder to reach regions um, be able to inform the, the premium technology that Carno offers? How do you plan to, to reach that segment? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and for a technology like this, it is, it is a premium over, say, like a traditional diesel generator or even uh, a biogas uh, generator, which is even more expensive. Um, so the business model we developed with uh, McKenna University was a, a co-op run business model where the upfront cost of the generator would be subsidized by uh, local or, or regional governments um, for which in a country like Ethiopia, you know, they already have a mandate to um, have 100% energy access by 2025. So there is incentive there to sort of go along that business model. Uh, in terms of the running costs, um, I mean, the advantage of a, a really high efficiency engine, whatever fuel you run it on, be that hydrogen, biofuel or diesel, um, is that it has significantly reduced operating costs because you're just simply burning less fuel. Um, so from a running point of view, it is actually much more affordable than these rural communities going for, say, buying a traditional diesel one, which has a lot of maintenance and a lot of um, well, high running costs when it, when it comes to fuel. Um, so that, that's the kind of our, our, our business model for those regions. Um, in terms of the accessibility, I mean, our, our engines and the uh, another benefit of ceramic is the sort of density aspect. They're much lighter and more compact. 
which means you know we can achieve much higher power density if you like um than other traditional um uh, but generators or are all renewable um uh, options uh, which means that they're very easily deployable especially to sort of um, hard to reach regions um the fact that we don't have cooling systems and oil systems which is a common mode of failure in generators means that there's much much lower maintenance as well um so the whole accessibility thing becomes uh sort of quite quite um quite good for our technology yeah it sounds like there's you know a lot of you know potential benefits there fuel savings durability etc uh i guess one quick follow-up question for you then is why haven't other engine manufacturers tried this before uh, i've been trying to wrap my head around that one so anything on that would be helpful to understand yeah it's a good question uh, it's a question we get asked a lot and uh, as i mentioned you know engines we've got 150 years 200 years experience uh, using them um and like like some other technologies here you know it, it's not necessarily engine is not new um and, and and engine manufacturers they have tried to go down the ceramic engine route before um, especially in the 80s and 90s, that fundamentally the issue was that um, the innovation at, at that point was all around minimizing impact on supply chain, uh, which is often the way large manufacturers go. Um, minimizing impact on supply chain, minimizing design changes. And essentially what happened is they, they tried to fit ceramics into a conventional engine. So trying to operate them the same way metals do just without the cooling system which meant that you had thermal gradients cyclic tensile loading among other issues and fundamentally ceramics just don't behave like metals do um so then they went down one of two options uh, which was either trying to develop a, a ceramic that had specific properties similar to metallic ones that allowed it to deal with the conditions or to go down the route of um making kind of like liners or sleeves for the hot components that would protect them from the heat a little bit more so that the latter option um, was successful but it had basically a very very small amount of actual uh, performance gains that meant it wasn't really pursued anymore and and the, the former option was just incredibly expensive and at that particular time there was no incentive to to really go down that route and um, what we've done is is fundamentally different uh, what we've done is redesign the engine from the point of view of the ceramics. So looking at uh, ceramic properties uh, and then designing the engine around it so that when, you know, we're not trying to force ceramics to work in, in environments they can't. Um, for example, our design completely eliminates things like cyclic tensile loading. So you don't have, uh, you know, tensile forces on, on, on ceramic. The best comparison I can make is, is a concrete pillar it's fantastic in compression. Uh, as soon as you try and pull it apart, the thing crumbles. Um, ceramics are very similar. So part of the design is making sure that there's none of that pulling, pulling force. Uh, and second of all is eliminating thermal gradients. So all thermal gradients of the engine are handled by non-structural components with a different ceramic that has different properties to the one used for structural ones. So, uh, you know, RIP, is not the use of ceramics and engines. That is not something we ever plan or, or have tried to pattern. Um, the IP is very much around the technologies that enable the ceramics to work. Um, and that's really sort of our, our core technology. It's the mechanisms we've got to, to mitigate the issues you would normally have with, with a ceramic engine. Yeah, I think that's helpful, helpful clarification. Um, and great to know some specifics there on how you're plugging in um, to bring some uh, a new look um, to 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 an older technology uh, or at least use case. Yes, I wanted to to come to you on a somewhat adjacent line. Uh, so uh, I'm curious to know more about um, um, the pathway towards enabling more utilities um, to accelerate the transition towards sustainable, affordable, uh, and reliable electricity for all. Uh, again, you know, utilities have been off operating for. Um, a large number of years, of course, you know, some in, in some of these markets are, you know, on the newer edge, um, but I, I'm curious to know in, in bringing your technology, which might be new and innovative to, to that segment, uh, what are your plans really for un, uh, addressing what are a number of bottlenecks for those utilities? Yeah, absolutely. Would would love to, to share that. Um, 
so 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 one of the the major differences right when when we started off we 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 started looking at you know how how the uh, the utilities are are currently monitoring their infrastructure to to understand you know how much uh, how what are their decision support strategies uh, in place uh, one of the main main systems that they use is is a scada system um you know which is typically it's, it's like a supervisory control system that's uh, deployed across control you know, basically there in control centers but these scada systems are um uh, they really cost uh, they're, 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 they're costly. Um, uh, they, they require a lot of revenue as well as a lot of um, uh, long periods for deployment, right? Um, in, in a lot of cases that I saw that uh, SCADA systems are deployed at a very high level, um, maybe at a 33 kV or a high voltage network, not necessarily in the secondary distribution networks. And uh, in, in the in the smaller utilities, they're usually not deployed at all or, you know, some a system integrator came in, deployed something, and they're not really being used effectively at, at that stage. Um, so with that, what we realized is that, you know, let's try to build a, a complete open system that, you know, can be deployed in, in pieces as per the customer's requirements and try to focus on the benefits that, that, the, that the utility would get. Um, so, you know, the, our system can be deployed, only the algorithms, only the analytics could be deployed for just real-time monitoring to, to, to gain visibility, um, or it could be, you know, done like a, a, a large-scale deployment. Um, the first pilot project that we did was actually with the utility in India. Um, this, is a, this is the second largest utility globally in terms of number of customers and, 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 and the power delivery. Um, and they had all these sophisticated technologies for the big cities, uh, but they didn't have anything for the rural uh, parts of the network, right? Um, um, so that's where we went in. We deployed our IoT sensors. We actually worked with a 2G uh, uh, cellular connectivity, right? So you know, it's not even 3 or, or 4G or 5G, but it was actually 2G networks. Uh, very intermittent in in communication, so we you know, we had to tackle cha challenges around um, just having data storing, making sure that there's no there's no data loss in between, um, and so on. And and overall, we were we were able to deploy the entire system uh, effectively. And now the utilities, you know, they're getting a visibility into understanding how much how much are the outages on the network. If they are telling their farmers that. Uh, there's going to be an outage for uh, for eight hours. Is it actually eight hours or is it ten or twelve? Um, you know, are are some of the transformers working in an overloaded condition? Some are uh, completely underloaded. You know, can you optimize the network for for more efficient delivery and, and so on? And uh, you know, these these are just first steps, right? These are first steps in understanding what's going on. Once you have that visibility, now they started to think about you know, can we have uh, on-site solar generation because you know this network in this place is not really being utilized. You know, can we have a feed-in from from here because there's, there's good um, uh, solar irradiation happening there? And you know, how can we start utilizing more of the network to to enable a faster transition towards towards clean energies, in, mainly in the rural parts? Um, so, so there are many different opportunities. You know, once once you have a good monitoring system in place, yeah. Very good. Thanks for that. And uh, appreciate again that you're really bringing greater, greater visibility to, to data um, to improve some of that decision making, um, you know, on the part of those those utilities. So that's great to see. Uh, I wanted to stay on that topic of data. Uh, and Vanessa was curious to come back to you um, uh, in regards to, to that topic on data mm -hmm. and what you can gather um, from from the hubs. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, there's, there's a good amount of data that you can collect from those yep. and, you know, everyone's talking about data. So uh, I'm curious to know from you, uh, you know, what are some of those, you know, potential use cases or, or you know, areas of value which, which you think you can gather from getting that yep. data that you're collecting through the hubs? Perfect. No, so, so there's actually... The thing is, it's because it's such almost a blank canvas of possibilities, there's a great um, um, spectrum that you can find data on. You can do data from direct inquiries through surveys and quizzes. So with a particular purpose, we did run some of these in India doing our R&D about um, health 
uh, consumer behavior. And we also ran a campaign which was about spread joy, not rumors, because as we know in India, there's uh, problems can go with rumors as far as people being killed in, in, in rural communities. So that's one application, which is direct research. But by just the simple usage of the content that we're providing, uh, NGOs, organizations that are providing, for example, health information or education information can actually measure their KPIs through the data that the hub provides. We can see as far as what type of phones they're using, how often they're charging, when they're charging. I must say everything is 100% data protected to the highest uh, of standards. But we can, through, uh, doing it correctly, find out what groups of people or particular users or in communities and groups in regions and countries or globally are engaging with in terms of content. It can be in either one of the four different um, content verticals that we're working in. So uh, within the education sphere, we can help the Ministry of Education, for example, improve the services if we're providing two options, which ones people are engaging with more and having more success with. We are actually working with uh, University College London, the Univers Trinity College Dublin, and University of Pavia with a group of researchers doing research on the actual economic impact of the education content that we are providing um, based on the metrics that the hubs can provide. So uh, doing controlled groups of deployment in refugee camps in particular or in rural communities, we're putting uh, almost like medical testing, controlled groups and uh, placebo groups to be able to measure the impact of different programs. For content partners, such as the YouTubes or the different production companies, when putting up content, which content is more popular, what people are staying on, what people are leaving, when they're flipping from one thing to another. The other thing is likes. So for example, we can have, even though it's not, we're not providing internet, it's a simulated mobile internet experience of curated content, we can actually do the likes. You know, we can actually have almost the full experience, but it's not the internet per se. So the data has a tremendous amount of usage, but we can learn a lot about services that are being provided and to improve services, not just from impact and developmental, but commercial as well. Perfect. Thank you for, for building further upon, upon that one. Thank you, Harry. Uh, absolutely. I, I wanted to come back. There was a, a comment um, that was mentioned on, on carbon credits um, by Greenpeace uh, coming out to say that carbon credits should be abolished. Um, so Emily, I wanted to come back to that one because I think that's an interesting point of discussion. I'm curious to know, do you have a response to that one? Uh, well, I think it's important to uh, know that there's two different types of carbon credit program, right? So you have the mandatory carbon credit program, which means you know there are laws in terms of how much you can end it. Um, and I think they're talking about these ones really, right? Because the big polluters can just emit as much as they want, and then they go and buy carbon credits. But there's also the voluntary carbon credit program, which really is a chance for local authorities, NGOs, you know, like any responsible citizen to, um, to, 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 to buy these credits and then uh, impact the environment positively, but also from a social point of view, have a huge impact on someone, someone's life. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's important to, to differentiate maybe between these two. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And I, I wanted to come back to, to one more audience question. I think we've got time for one more. And as it will be on the, the topic of energy storage, uh, I might pose this both to, to Oxto uh, and Gravitricity. Uh, so I'll, I'll pose a question to Oxto and then uh, Robin, it would be great to um, have the, the last word from you before we look to wrap up the session. Uh, but the question here, I think it's often asked about a number of energy storage technologies, uh, is when do you expect to see flywheel technology become cost effective? Uh, what would be required for this to happen, greater adoption from the demand side or more production from the supply side? Um, yeah, so uh, to be honest, I think definitely in terms of um, <clears throat> reaching economies of scale, that will help massively in terms of seeing our flywheels become cost effective. But even at the point where we are at the moment, they are cost effective. Um, we target applications that are 
long, long term applications because the flywheel has a lifespan of 25 years plus targeting applications who are going to be maximizing that lifetime. Those are the applications who are going to see the highest return on investment and see reap the most rewards and, and get the most the most cost back from um, their investment. Alternatively, I did mention earlier, we're looking um, at licensing as a possible um, revenue stream in the future. This is particularly cost effective um, in terms of like maximizing profits from one individual flywheel. The, the absence of degradation and the long lifetime means that we can actually reuse the flywheel for multiple clients if we licensed it for maybe 10 years for two different clients. Um, <clears throat> they'd be able to make maybe a 50% upfront cost um, payment, take the flywheel, save money on, on whatever they, on what they would have been saving before. Um, and it's cost effective for the client and it's, it's a good revenue stream um, for the business as well. So I think supply term in supplies, the supply side of things, economies of scale would really um, increase the um, cost effectiveness, but the adoption and the demand is definitely there. Um, we pretty much see new inquiries and new applications that we wouldn't have even thought about on a weekly basis, because realistically, we are we are a cost effective solution for anyone who is looking to improve the way they use energy or even down to like improving their local economy and improving human lives. Flywheels and energy storage systems should be like not just a environmentally friendly extra to have like a nice thing it should be something that communities see as a tool to improve every aspect of their community for social reasons and also for environmental and obviously for for profit as well great thank you emily and robin for over to you for for the last word here uh, i suppose along you know similar lines of course not flywheel technology um, but you're, you know, in early stage of, you know, various prototypes and starting to scale that up. So what's going to be required um, for your technology to be, again, cost effective um, and generally, you know, scale it? Will there be limitations around uh, available mines that you can develop? I'm curious to know your thoughts there. Yeah, thanks, Harry. And, and, I, and I, think, I think one of the complexities here is, is the different metrics with which you can, you can use to, to, to measure um, cost effectiveness and, and, and comparing different technologies. On, on levelized cost of energy over a 25 year period, Gravitricity is, is highly competitive at this point in time. Um, and that's because it doesn't degrade, um, because there is no a wholesale replacement of, of equipment. Um, it's highly efficient and there are no parasitic loads and, and all of those kind of feed into the business case. But as I said, they're, you know, they're, they're different metrics. And, and another one you can use is looking at the, the sort of the, 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 the dollar price per kilowatt hour. And, and that produces you know, somewhat different results. Um, we are currently um, on, on that particular metric, roughly where lithium iron was back in 2015. So, so not, not so long ago. And we all know that lithium iron has come down significantly in price over that period. Um, but I guess what you've got to factor in there is, is the number of deployments that some lithium iron and, and how progressed uh, a technology they are. Um, we're a novel, we're a new in, innovative technology, um, and we've got a long way to go down on our cost curve. So th there's plenty of reasons for thinking that, um, you know, we, we, can, uh, we, we can reduce that price. And, and cost down is a very important part of what we do. Um, one of the interesting things we're, we're discovering is that actually deploying our, 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 our facilities in existing mine shafts is actually a little bit more involved than you might think um, because of the challenges around repurposing mines, whereas actually digging new mines um, in new locations uh, to our specifications is actually much more straightforward than you might think. Um, uh, today we've got um, uh, equipment that can can dig mines fairly effectively without much human input, which it takes out a lot of health and safety and, and cost related considerations. Um, so we so we're much we're, we're we're versatile in that respect, and we can we can deploy where where energy storage is needed, and we're not therefore kind of tethered to um, to, to where there are existing mines. So we we, we think that's a great benefit as well.
Thank you, Robin. I um, appreciate that. And I'm uh, really excited about your innovation and also all of the innovations that have been shared here um, during our session today. Uh, that's about all the time that we have, but I hope that everyone's got uh, a greater understanding of the innovations that, that we've discussed and the Energy Catalyst program as well. I would like to take the time to thank all of our presenters today for giving their time and sharing their insights. Uh, also, thank you to the audience for attending and all of the engagement uh, on the chat. We really appreciate that. Uh, and then finally, a, a thank you to our colleagues at IntelliCAP for hosting the event. Um, so feel free to reach out um, to any of the uh, presenters uh, if you'd like to learn more uh, or engage further. That's after all why we're here today. So I hope that everyone has a great day and enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Harry.